put on and parchment uh, materials. Um, so I'll just give a quick introduction to who I am and my background um, before um, before we begin. Um, so I, I'm currently working with a company called Spencer and Fry. Um, so we are a group of preventive conservators um, and we specialize in collections care, collections management um, training and all aspects of preventive conservation. But um, before doing this, I was working as a, a practical paper conservator at a variety of different organizations and institutions. Um, and I've also done some freelance work with with leather and vellum, uh, bespoke leather and vellum uh, work in in different uh, companies as well. So hopefully um, I'll be able to to give you a bit of a background to these materials and give you some useful um, resources and links to go away with at the end. So. Um, to begin with, um, so hopefully the aims and objectives of this session, so hopefully uh, we can familiarise you uh, with the primary concerns involved with the care and safe handling of paper and parchment. Um, so this is hoping to cover a basic overview of the structure of these materials um, to help understand how they behave, um, recognise signs and characteristics of this ageing, how to spot possible weakness, uh, that results from the aging and how to handle them safely. Um, so hopefully at the end, um, I can give you some resources to take away and we'll have some time for questions as well. Um, so we'll do a section on paper first and then we'll have a, a short break in the middle and then we'll go into a section on parchment. So what is paper? Uh, paper is made from fibres of cellulose. So the cellulose can come in a variety of different sources, uh, such as rags in historic papers, wood, vegetable or plant fibres. Each type of fibre has different characteristics um, and when they're processed in different ways to make the different types of paper, um, they create different papers that also have these different types of characteristics. So, for example, like you can see in the picture, um, the different methods of production uh, and different characteristics of the fibres produce different papers and they're all suitable for a different variety of uses. Um, for example, you can have very thick absorbent papers like watercolour papers, uh, thin transparent papers like tracing papers and newspapers or papers that have shiny calendared surfaces that are more suitable for things like printing on. Uh, so when paper ages, um, without going too far into the science behind how paper will degrade, um, what essentially happens over time is that the chemical bonds within the paper structure itself, uh, called hydrogen bonds, they they hold the paper together um, and they will break down over over time and this is what causes it to degrade. So the breaking down of the hydrogen bonds in the paper structure can be catalyzed and sped up by a variety of things and that can include things like poor quality components or additives in the paper itself uh, or environmental factors like light, temperature and humidity. And so it's important to, to note that there's two things going on, that there's the, the materials which the paper is itself made up of um, and what may be in these. And then there's also the environment or the life of the paper that it's, that it's had and the environment it's been kept in that will kind of contribute and characterise the kind of degradation that you see on papers. Um, so with light um things like inks and things very susceptible can be very susceptible to fading in light um it's the uv uh, which is harmful to the paper itself the structure itself and also the materials on it so limiting light exposure is useful um and there is a kind of ideal temperature and relative humidity scope for paper uh, collections to be kept in 
Um, so it's around 40 to 55 percent relative humidity and 18 to 22 ish degrees. But it's important to note that it should be the fluctuations within an environment that are limited. Um, a stable environment is good to to maintain a stable environment as possible and realistically working this into uh, the management of an overall collection. Um, so for the breaking down of paper, so it is the, the chemical bonds holding the paper structure together that break down over time. Um, this is how it degrades and this characterizes how you would see it as looking, looking discolored, um, becoming fragile and losing flexibility within the paper. So it's good to recognize that different papers will also age and respond to these environmental factors differently. Um, so historic papers that are made for things from things like uh, cotton rags, um, they're frequently comprised of better quality materials than some modern papers, um, which means that maybe counterintuitively, they can often be in overall better condition and perhaps more stable. Uh, they can retain better structural integrity over time, um, even though they may be older. Um, this is due to industry growing over time and mass production coming in within papers um, and paper production and cheaper materials becoming available and more widely used. Um, and these readily available methods um, meant that the the quality of the components being added within the papers um, and the quality of the papers themselves their longevity um, can decline um, so these these types of papers can contain frequently more acidic co components like things like lignin um, and they result in this more rapid degradation and loss of structure and fragility so something that you might be really familiar with is this orangey brown, brittle discoloration of newspapers, they become very flaky and fragile. So that's that's what's happening there. That's the characteristic that you can see of, of things like lignin within papers um, that really suffer from that degradation. Um, so they can also contain shorter chains of the hydrogen bonds, a higher amount of lignin, which is a catalyst for the degradation. Um, and that's why they become so extremely brittle and Give you this discoloration. So just to recap um, and a few examples of things that you might see on documents, a few things that I have been working with and dealing with, you can see that uh, the papers are kind of this yellowy browny colour, um, the edges are beginning to get fragile uh, and, and break away. Um, and here you can see, especially at the edges of the paper, um, they're becoming very brittle. Um, so this breaking down of the cellulose and the structure and the degradation uh, causes this brittle flakiness. It tends to happen more at the edges of papers um, and they begin to crack and break away. Um, it's something good to just have in mind when handling um, is that the edges can be particularly, particularly flaky. And so I think it's probably obvious that over time, papers will also incur wear from handling and use. Uh, they tend to be more fragile at the edges where they're more exposed. Um, so places like the bottom right hand corner where you would turn the pages of a book, um, that can be a particularly fragile place to handle things from. Um, and along any folds or creases or tears that might be in documents or papers. Um, so probably you'll be familiar with also foxing, um, something that we call foxing. It's these brown spots that you can see on papers. Um, so this could be due to a really wide variety of things. Um, a fairly common cause of this can be uh, from tiny metal deposits that may have been left in papers from the manufacturing process. Um, and these, as papers age over time as well, they age as well and can become discolored and give you these little brown spots or marks in the papers.
So there are other external factors which can also contribute to um, to the loss of structure uh, and fragility of papers over time, things to look out for um, in collections and when handling. Um, things like damage from pests, um, which we can see on the left in the image here. Um, so they like to eat through papers, uh, various different types of pests. Um, they can leave paper extremely fragile um, with this lace-like structure from the holes where they've actually eaten through the whole document. Um, so one of the resources that I will point you to at the end is a very useful guide from English Heritage that gives you um, a chart where you can identify different types of uh, pests or museum in museum or historic environments that is I found very useful um, in my work. Um, there in the middle is an example of mold damage. Um, so mold is another factor um, that can contribute to uh, the degradation of papers, um, it can actually change the structure of the paper itself. And you can see in the picture here, um, it's very stained and discolored. Um, so it can also make paper extremely fragile. Um, with mould, it can kind of become fluffy or thin um, and very, very fine in the areas that are affected by mould. Um, so if you ever do see evidence of mould on papers or think that, that it might be there, um, it's quite hard to identify, um, but if it is active, it can be harmful to inhale and it can be very irritating to skin. Um, so it could be useful if in doubt to just seek some further information on that, um, contact either a conservator or someone that can, can help with identifying mould um, if it may be an issue. Um, and the last image that we see here is uh, media, an example of media on the paper, um, actually eating through the paper, damaging it itself. So this is iron gore ink. Um, and this is seen on lots and lots of uh, particularly archival documents uh, as a writing material. Um, and it contains in the ink itself uh, components which are corrosive to the paper. And so it'll actually eat away at the paper itself over time and give you again the, the lace-like structure within the paper, um, taking on the shape of the letters. Um, and this obviously can make papers really weak. Uh, places can just almost fall away as you turn the page uh, where the ink's actually eaten through the whole of the page. And so as a summary of aging papers, um, things to look out for color. So maybe you would want to take extra care when you're handling with papers, when you see that they're yellow, brown, discolored, it could be an indication of their fragility. Um, so age, uh, maybe it's good to be wary of modern mass produced papers like newspapers. They can be tricky and um, in quite poor condition. Uh, edges and folds can be very fragile and brittle. Tears um, can often occur along the handling edges of papers. Um, just be aware of anything like mould that might be growing. Uh, media, damage from possible media like iron gore inks or any pest activity. And so these are a few of the main things that can affect papers over time. So as well as the paper components itself, uh, the environment in which papers housed, um, in enclosures and backings and tapes, uh, how these, what these papers are stored in can also affect their condition over time and how they will age. Um, so things like um, pockets, um, archive, it, they should ideally be made and housed from archival materials. Um, some unsuitable enclosures like uh, these plastic wallets and folders or acidic, things like acidic window mounts, which are really commonly used within framing, um, can cause staining and damage to papers. The, the discoloration as the components of the enclosures themselves degrade over time can offset onto the papers. Sometimes um, media can become stuck or attached to these over time as the interaction of the, the inks or the media on the paper and the enclosure itself 
takes place. Um, so it's good to be aware of this and um, something to note if you are frequently rehousing materials or taking things in and out of the folders. Uh, the window mounts, something to look for um, with these is that the, the inside edge can be, again, an orange or yellow colour, uh, very discoloured, and that can actually leave a halo of discoloration around an image or on the paper where the acidic components within the cardboard of the mount itself have offset onto the paper and you get this halo around the edge. Um, so the poor quality housings themselves can also frequently come with poor quality tapes and framing tapes and sellotapes and things like this um, that are used to stick papers to things like backings and mounts. Um, so as they break down again, they can stain the papers to this really horrible dark orange uh, colour. Um, so the tapes themselves will become fragile and break down um, and the adhesives on them will eventually um, kind of fail completely, maybe in some areas. Um, and it can then again be useful to bear in mind that if there's anything that is attached with poor quality tapes to a frame, that backings and supports and things like this can actually fall out completely if you're picking something up or reframing something to be aware that it could, that could be liable to happen. That has happened to me in the past. Um, again, if looking at or dealing with something um, with these with these tapes, age tapes, um, it can sometimes look like they might be easy to remove. They might be coming away, um, but adhesives can usually fail again towards the outside of, of a tape, towards the center. Um, it may be still stuck or idiot. So um, if you are tempted to pull on a, a tape or something that looks like it can be easily removed, just be aware that it may be coming away at the edges, but the middle still may be very much stuck within that. Um, a quick note on fastenings as well. So things like paper clips, pins and staples. Um, these are seen a lot in um, things like archives and libraries. Um, they can frequently be very rusty um, and stain and also corrode over time. They can actually eat into the papers themselves, become corrosive, but um, can also stick the papers together can become almost fused with them over time. Um, so that's something to, to note and be aware of as well. So moving on to handling papers, um, just some basic good practice. Um, when we are handling papers, a few points of note are to have clean dry hands. Um, no loose clothing that may get in the way or interfere, things like lanyards, scarves, rings, bracelets, um, be aware of these. Um, have in mind that a suitable workspace should be clean and ideally dust free if possible. Um, be sure to have enough space for unrolling or unfolding of large formats um, that might be needed. So things like base materials, large sheets of protective materials like Tyvek, or archival papers are really useful as a good work surface to, to have. Um, and things, anything like weights um, or supports that you may need to, to have to hand, it's good to have these beforehand, prepare everything and make sure that these are easily available when you're working, working with documents. Um, if you need, if you do have weights, then ideally um, they should be clean, no kind of old metal weights that could potentially mark or offset onto papers. And these can also be wrapped in things like Tyvek or archival papers um, to, to help with that as well. Um, so when handling papers, obviously they can come uh, in all manner of different formats and each type of paper format when handling it has its particular concerns. Um, so some things which you may frequently uh, meet are things like unbound items, archival documents, um, like you see here in the picture. Um, so 
when consulting these and handling these, um, lifting and turning pages one by one is um, is good practice. Um, keeping them in the original order, just be aware if you're working through a big stack of paper documents that um, that can easily they can easily become unordered. Um, Ideally, keeping smaller items uh, towards the center of stacks. This will help prevent dissociation or damage of these. Um, trying to avoid edges of papers hanging out over each other. Um, they can become curled and kind of folded over the edges of the stacks um, and they tend to stick, stick over each other and that can cause damage and tearing over time. So if there are items grouped together with things like treasury tags, uh, or similar fastenings, it's important to make sure that there's enough slack on these to turn the pages safely without them being restricted. Um, so to, to be aware that that needs to be long enough, there needs to be enough um, kind of room on, on the tag itself to turn the pages without that restricting the turning in the corner. Um, so again, where things like these fastenings are holding the papers together, that can be a very fragile place. So if it's anything metal, that can have degraded uh, around, around that area or corroded, um, just be aware that that could be a point of weakness for handling these papers. Fold outs and rolled items. So things like maps, uh, fold outs, these can frequently be quite a lot larger than originally expected. Um, these can have hidden damages and weaknesses, especially along things like fold, fold lines, where they've been folded. Um, and often things like this can have been repaired in the past. Um, things like sellotape, uh, questionable adhesives um, can sometimes be used for this. So like you can see on this map, it's got a very, um, old aged tape repair that's been applied in the past. Um, it's good to be prepared with enough space whenever you're going to be handling or consulting something that is uh, rolled or, or folded, um, just, just in case. Um, so I would always advise going carefully and slowly as you, I can never really be 100% sure how something is wanting to unfold the actual format, which way or direction um, you'll actually have to go until you're there handling the object itself. And so again, books and bound materials. Um, so in a way, books are a kind of world of their own. Um, I just wanted to touch on here um, the kind of structures and different things that you will see uh, within books and just a basic how to of safe handling, um, how to set up a book um, easily and comfortably when you're when you're handling them. Um, but they books themselves can be made from a different, a huge wide variety of different techniques uh, made for different purposes and using different materials. So in terms of handling them, um, the different types of binding or the different types of materials used will obviously affect how these behave. Um, so in terms of handling, they, they can be basic binding formats like tight back, uh, hollow back or case band books, um, and that all affects how they open and how they'll be treated. Um, so the main thing when thinking about handling books is to support the boards on the books correctly. Um, so that will avoid pressure between the joins um, of the boards and the text block of the book. Um, they're the weakest points of a book structure, some of the weakest points. Um, and just something to be in mind, mindful of as well is that different types of books will have different types of opening angles and restrictions. Um, some like old prayer books, for example, um, kind of could be designed just to fit in the palm of someone's hand and were never designed to open beyond a certain angle. Um, so being aware of things like this uh, and just knowing things like this um, can maybe help with knowing how naturally far something will want to open or not open. Um, and if you feel any resistance, then uh, just don't try and force something open beyond a natural a natural point. Um, 
And one thing, taking books from shelves. So if you are taking a book from a shelf, a common thing to do is to reach for the top of the spine um, and pull a book from the top by the head cap um, outwards. This is actually quite a fragile area of the book structure. Um, so spines can sometimes be be weak or or degraded and kind of come away. And that is has the potential, removing a book from a shelf in that way, it's got the potential to actually cause more damage to the spine and to that area. So ideally, um, when you're pulling books from shelves or taking books from shelves, um, it's good to grab from the middle of the spine instead of this backwards from the top motion. Um, so something that can help with that is pushing the books to either side of the book that you need, either forwards and, and then trying to pull from the middle of the spine the book that you're you're working with out in that way. And that's a much better way to, and hopefully a simple way to avoid possible, possible damages that come from handling. Um, and there's something that you might see is also something called red rot. Um, so this is on books that are leather bound or contain leather parts. Um, it's a, a red powdery deposit that you can see um, on books um, and it's caused to the leather itself degrading. Um, and it's, it tends to be this red dust that, that offsets and can get, get onto papers and hands and skin. Um, it can cause irritation to skin um, if it's particularly sensitive. So you can actually, you may want to wear gloves generally when, when working with paper, you wouldn't wear gloves. There's no need to wear gloves and it can actually impede sensitivity when, when handling working with papers. But if there is something like mold or red rot, then it, it's fine. It's advisable to, to protect your skin and yourselves. Um, it's a good, good idea if you do think that there's red rot on something, if you do see this red dust, and um, to just try and make sure everything is kept clean, it offsets onto things really easily. Um, it can get onto work surfaces, book supports, um, and just making sure that everything is dusted off and cleaned enough. So it can doesn't have the potential to stain papers and things, or the next user of something doesn't then also encounter something um, that has red rot on it as well. And um, so this slide is just hopefully um, an, a visual example of how not in the top row to, to set up a book um, and how to in the bottom row to set up a book. Um, so this was a very large uh, volume, uh, a springback volume um, that is very large and heavy, quite unwieldy, quite difficult to work with. Um, so a good example of something that could be maybe a bit intimidating to uh, set up or to know how to how to use. Um, so it's just to kind of visually reiterate what I was trying to say before is that you can see in the top row that there's not much support being given to the joins and the opening angles of the book. Um, and that's going to put pressure on the overall structure and the whole thing over time when you're when you're opening it like this. Um, so in the bottom row, you can see where the book supports um, have been used to give support along the, the joins where the book boards and the text block meet. So it's built up um, more on the left or the right. It's built up to the correct size that you may want to, to give the right level of support to the joins on the book. And you can adjust that angle um, as you work through the book to help you yeah move safely through it and make sure that there's not too much pressure on the joints or the structure at any one point um so that that's all i have on paper for you um so i think the next next section i'll move into to parchment and cover a similar kind of overview of handling and structural materials but um at this point, if anybody has any questions um, or wants a break, um, I think now would be a good a good time to naturally naturally do that. Shall I um read hello? <laughs> Shall Hi. I give you a quick um read through of any of the um questions that 
have come up. I don't know if you can see. Shall I read them out to you? Okay, we have from Bryony, um, what would be a reasonable level of fluctuation of RH and temp for paper? And she says, is it plus or minus five RH, question mark? Um, it's normally plus or minus five, um, yes, for paper, for paper collections. Um, I think overall, um, within a collections management um, of the whole collection, that should be taken into consideration. Um, I think um, plus or minus 10 degrees, I think, for a, in 20, I think it was 24 hours for an overall collection, dependent on what the materials and things are. It depends what else is being stored within um, the environment that the paper's in. But yeah, plus or minus five is normally yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so next one we have is, can the residue from old adhesive, so, oh, this is from Emma, sorry. Can the residue from old adhesive, such as sellotape, be removed by a conservator or is the staining for keeps? Thanks. Um, the Generally, the adhesives, um, dependent on what it is, so different tapes will have different adhesives in them and um, different conservation techniques can can take off these adhesives or loosen them um, and kind of remove remove the residue, maybe not completely, but definitely to a certain degree. Um, the staining itself, um, that would probably have to, if you were to address the actual staining, be possibly removed in a different type of treatment. Um, a lot of the time, if this is very severely set in or is very, very dark, um, it can't be it can't be completely removed over time. It could maybe be reduced. Um, but again, it depends, I think, on the intention of uh, the removal. So the adhesives can be harmful to the paper itself. Um, so it's it may be good to remove these, but then bearing in mind any treatment that a conservator will do on top of the, the adhesive itself will also be adding a stress to the, the paper itself as well. Um, and if that is something that's using like solvents or chemicals in a way to remove something that can also contribute to um, degradations of the papers. So things like stain removal, um, if it's done for purely aesthetic or visual ways, um, that needs to be kind of balanced with what effect that would have on the paper as well over time, that treatment. Great. Um, we have another question <clears throat> from Caroline. Um, we have a large collection of ships plans which are folded. This includes tracing paper, which is up to 120 years old. We're thinking some of these will never be opened as so weak on the folds. I think they're just concerned maybe that the folds have got very weak because they're folded. So maybe if you had any advice. Yeah, um, I think tracing papers are it's they're similar to newspapers in that way, in that they they can become yeah very very fragile. Um, and I think if they're folded, potentially yeah that sounds like um, they could be could be quite fragile. Um, if you did want to have a chat or any advice or anything um, on that afterwards, then I can I can give my email um, or pop it around at the end, and then yeah we could. Um, have a, a bit of a discussion about um, the tracing papers and um, and yeah, what what's happening there? That would be if that would be helpful. Sorry to jump in. I was just going to say that um, if anyone's got any um, conservation inquiries, then you can contact your MDO and then they can hook you up. Certainly in the southeast, we have the um, collection care surgeries, the Spencer and Fry that we can offer. Um, so let us know. All right, we've got a, one more. Um, uh, we have a lot of paper in our care and some of the most precious items have Tyvek laid on top, soft side down. Is there any better ways of looking after them? Get a, getting proper Tyvek sized up to the item? Question mark. Sorry, so the, there's ty Tyvek covering. Yes, so they've got layers of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining sort of maybe a box or a drawer with, objects mm -hmm. and then Tyvek on top, soft side down. 
And they're wondering if you size maybe the Tyvek to the object or a folder or something. Ah, we put Tyvek on at night to protect dust overnight. And that was on, on paper? Yes. Okay. Um, I think uh, ideally, like it's good to Tyvek, Tyvek's fine. Um, you could, yeah, cut cut Tyvek to, to size for things. Um, for papers, you can also store things in archival boxes. So there's boxes that you can get, which are uh, various sizes um, and folders, and they're made from archival papers. That creates a kind of um, a neat storage environment and the archival that keeps away dust helps give us like barrier, more of a barrier from the environment outside any fluctuations and things um, or archival folders um, and things like that that can be made or bought to size um, to fit the papers. Uh, that's probably probably what I would go to um, as a as a storage method. If they're larger things, um, you can can make homemade folders or kind of these four flap enclosures um, for for papers that you can just make out of archival card and you can fold um, to fit uh, exactly the the objects themselves. Brilliant. I've got um, uh, a couple more and then perhaps we'll have a break. But um, Caroline says about the tracing papers that they're, they're weak and overall, not just um, the folds. Uh, but she said the added problem is that they're up to 16 feet in length. <laughs> wow. That's I wonder if good. rolling them might be better. What do you think? I think it it depends on on how fragile they are i mean it has i'm wondering if any of them have been unfolded or anything has been tested i think with tracing papers they can be really they can they can break very easily the whole thing if it i'm not sure it would withstand uh, a rolling if it was very fragile it might split i think it's it's not got the elasticity maybe um yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. Um, I would be. Yeah, that might be. I wonder if they, yeah, I wonder if they could be, it sounds like they may need a lining or support or something. Um, I, I wonder if they are, are they already, have they already been unfolded and tested or? Yes, Caroline, I, I would suggest you contact your MDO because you might be able to go for, a, if you're in the Southeast, sorry guys, I don't know about the other regions, but you might be able to go for, a, collection care grant or get a conservation surgery because that sounds very specific to your collection but um one more we have one from Ruth saying we have some journals diaries from the 1980s through to modern day and they're stored in really useful boxes with acid-free paper is that okay and um, that's that's okay as a, a temporary solution um for yeah, for uh, for papers that provides a a buffer from the environment outside, and acid-free paper, um, acid-free tissue is can be wrapped around things. That's completely fine. Good for papers. Um, ideally, I suppose a uh, an archival um, an archival box of some kind made from archival materials, if that's possible over time, then that would be that would be good. But that's um, the acid free and uh, a box where there's a buffer from the outside environment is is ideal is good um just I think making sure if there's anything that is in there um bearing in mind what's housed together if there's anything that has the potential to be moldy or um kind of offset onto anything else just being aware if you're putting things within a box or enclosure together what's going in together great so just Two more things, I think. Um, oops, there we go. So uh, Caroline says about her um, tracing paper, you're right, they're too fragile to roll. There you are. And um, some of the smaller ones are unfolded, um, but they make a judgment on each plan. So um, uh, so that's great. Um, Cher and London also uh, offer the, the conservation surgeries. So they've put their links there and um and the same for um southeast so that's brilliant i'm sure everyone will be in touch after this session and um, one more question before the break hannah says is it a problem to store books flat on top of each other should they always be stored in a bookshelf formation and what is the best way to store them 
Um, no, it's not a problem to to store books flat on top of each other. Um, it depends again on what type of book it is and the the shape and the the structure of it. Um, so I think if you are storing books stacked on top of each other, um, to have the spines alternating um, can be a good kind of technique. It means that there might not be any pressure building up on one side where there's a a big line of spines. Um, so if you have a stack, if you have a book at the bottom and then the spine is on the left, the one on top of it, the spine is on the right and then the left and the right um, and kind of align these, make sure there's nothing overhanging, just, yeah, insensible kind of neat piles like that, that's fine. Um, if you're storing books upright on a shelf, um, that's also fine, uh, it can save space. But if they are like this last picture that I, I showed, for example, something with a huge bulky spine and that is, um, it's got a very large text block. Uh, the the text block itself, the pages can actually sag over time. If it's upright, it's pulling down and the weight of all the pages can um, can make the whole structure sag and the book can misshape if it's very heavy and on a shelf a long time over time like that. So sometimes you can get just a so something like a plaster zoat, um just a piece or wedge or a little support um, or something called a book shoe for the for the books uh, that might be susceptible to that happening um, and if they're going to be stored upright on a shelf as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. And so we're just going to have a break and head on to um, parchment after the break. Um, so if everyone wants to take 10 minutes, we'll meet at five to 11 um, and think up any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And I'm sure if you've got any burning paper questions, not burning paper, but any questions about paper as well, we can pick them up at the end of the session. Um, okay, so everyone head off and have a cuppa. <laughs> See you in 10 minutes. Judgment materials. Um, Parchment's the name for animal skin that's been prepared for the use of writing or printing. Um, it's one of the oldest writing materials and predates the use of paper. Um, historically, it's been used instead of paper for important documents like religious texts, uh, public laws and land records uh, due to its strength and durability. Uh, it's very, very strong and um, the material lasts very well. Um, parchment can be made from different types of skin, uh, such as cow, goat and sheep skins. Um, but the term vellum refers, refers specifically just to calf skin. Uh, the manufacture of parchment is a very labour intensive and specialised and messy process. Um, this involves the hair being scraped away from the flesh side of the skin um, and it's, the skin is then stretched onto a wooden frame. A special curved knife is used for this um, and the skins themselves while this is happening are wetted, scraped and dried multiple times uh, in order to give the right thickness and tautness to a skin. Um, they're also sometimes finished with a chalk or a pumice and that is to kind of affect or tune the writing surface um, to make the, the surface of the skin more suitable to accepting ink. So a brief um, kind of overview of the structure of parchment. Um, it's made up of densely packed collagen fibres um, and when parchment ages or degrades, um, as we talked about with the paper, uh, it's the collagen bonds within the structure of the parchment that will break down. And, and it's that that causes the changes um, to the structure of the, the parchment itself as the breakdown of the cellulose fibers causes the breakdown and the, the changes within the paper as the paper ages as well. And so it's the, the breakdown and the degradation of this, this collagen and the structure of the parchment and it this changes the appearance and the behaviours of the material over time.
So the overall characteristics of every sheet of parchment, um, will, they will each be the same, the same kind of overarching characteristics, but each will have a, a, a identifiable hair side and a flesh side. Uh, both the hair and the flesh side of a sheet of parchment um, are acceptable, uh, will accept writing or ink or media, so both can be used as a writing surface or a printing surface. Um, and these can both be kind of identified or told by certain characteristics. Um, as you can see, hopefully in here, uh, the hair side can be recognised by the follicle patterns um, from the actual hair of the animal. Um, and that can be seen in the skin. It's more yellow than the flesh side. Um, and the flesh side will usually be a little bit smoother and whiter. Um, and you won't see the the kind of follicle patterns that you'll see on the hair side. So that can be seen on the two on the two different sides of a sheet of parchment on the on the skin where there'll be the underside with the flesh and the top side with the hair. So even though all parchment exhibits the same overall characteristics, uh, the sheets are made from the skins of different animals and every creature is different. So with this, that means that every sheet of parchment is also slightly different and they all retain their own particularities and characteristics. Um, so some sheets of parchment can be thicker or thinner or hairier. Uh, different types of skin, um, different areas of skin can be thicker uh, or thinner in areas with things like the spine and the leg joints where, where they would have been on an animal. They can be particularly tough um, and the areas where parchment is, is thickest and most durable, um, that's because the, the skin was actually, there's more skin around here. It's the thickest, toughest area of the skin itself. Um, you can see sometimes little features of things like uh, scars, shot wounds or, or little patches of hair even sometimes still left on on parchment um, and that can kind of give a bit of an insight into this actually having once been an animal or what happened to the animal in the past. And so as skin obviously needs to be tough, uh, parchment is one of the strongest and most durable materials. And for a large part, this can survive very well in collections over time. Um, it stands up extremely well to damage from handling. Um, it's got great tensile strength and it can be very, very difficult to tear. Um, this doesn't mean to say that it's indestructible. Uh, it can still age, will still age and degrade over time um, and will, as with paper, also become yellow. Um, can become yellow and slightly discoloured over time or yellow from, from maybe nice white colour um, to a yellow, darker yellow. Uh, the collagen bonds in the structure of the skin, uh, they begin to break down. Um, and as, again, with papers, it's the internal kind of mechanisms and components of the parchment itself uh, that will affect how it ages over time, but also the environment um, will also affect um, the characteristics and the degradation um, and acceleration or not of that over time within the parchment as well. Um, so one of the key factors and the characteristics of parchment is that it's extremely sensitive to changes in the environment like humidity and temperature. Uh, so if it's housed in unsuitable environments, parchment will expand and contract a lot um, due to the water absorption capabilities. Um, and so a, a key factor um, for storing parchment is to bear in mind um, that as, as with paper, but even more so, I think, with parchment documents, because it's got this amazing capability to uptake and with with withhold water, um, it's to limit fluctuations in the environment, um, as that causes fluctuations and expansion of contraction of the parchment itself. Um, so I, an ideal is around 50%, plus or minus 5% um, RH. Um, and around 15 degrees plus or minus 5%. This this can be, I, 
this is an idea. I think the main thing is to limit fluctuations as much as possible within parchment and bear in mind that um, it needs to be as fixed an environment as possible and that damp conditions for parchment are um, very, can be very harmful. Um, and this, if there is parchment within a collection, it's good to bear these things in mind, but again, work work in the safe storage to, to what also has to work for an overall uh, model for collection care and storage. Um, so one of the, the biggest threats to the longevity of parchment over time is water and damp conditions. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's extremely reactive to environmental changes and damp environments can result in um, excessive water uptake in parchment items. So if they are left for a long time in very damp environments, the fibres within the parchment itself begin to realign themselves um, and that causes these planar alterations that you can see the drastic alterations to the structure of parchment um, and damp conditions can also uh, result in softening of parchment um, and the the object can expand actually beyond its original dimensions uh, with this water uptake um, and that can cause deformations big deformations within documents themselves um, and that can cause also increased darkening and discoloration of skin. It can encourage mold growth and soften and solubilize media uh, and alter any surface uh, preparations or coatings that may have been applied to the parchment itself as well. Um, so media like inks and pigments, um, if parchment is stored in the damp environment, can offset. They can, can offset onto or bleed onto adjacent surfaces. Um, and they can also bleed within the parchment itself. So if there's something very damp, it can kind of solubize uh, potentially harmful or damaging components in the makeup of the, the media that may be on, on the parchment itself. And that can leach into the structure of the parchment it's, as well, as well as staining it. Um, so severely wet environments can cause sometimes this complete gelatinization of parchment um, where it can become too saturated with too much water. Um, it'll effectively begin to break down into gelatin. Um, so first of all, this can appear, it will lose its strength. It will become very floppy and turn translucent. And then eventually this will dry extremely solidly and it will set in any deformations or shapes that have that have been, it's been contracted into over time, and it will set into this very hard um, kind of structure. Uh, I think you can see here on the right an example of a just a very warped uh, parchment document. Um, so on a on a side note, um, if a if a sheet of parchment does become damp or wet or is kind of subject to this. A conservation treatment, any conservation treatment that we would do um, would be the parchment would be subject to a controlled drying environment. So it would involve the application of tension uh, and this tension would be added with the intention of avoiding these deformations that can be set into the skin if it contracts. Um, so again, on this picture here, I think you can see on the bottom, this is an example of a, a treatment that's been done. Um, where something has been, has maybe been humidified or has been damp and is being dried on this board. So around the edges of the parchment, you can see bulldog clips, and these are pinned onto a cork board with um, the, these kind of pins through the, the holes in the bulldog clips. And this pulling, um, as the parchment dries, it'll contract inwards. And this counter tension that's created by the fixed points of the bulldog clips will help uh, re result in it drying in a, a nice flat, hopefully, uh, structure rather than drying in an uncontrolled way, which can cause warps and deformations um, within the parchment itself. It's just something to be aware of how it reacts and behaves. Another main threat to parchment um, is the mould growth that can also result from damp conditions, um, especially both conditions that are too warm and too damp, and there is not much air circulation in. Um, 
So mould, as with paper, it can stain and weaken uh, the surfaces of parchment. Um, and that's something to be aware of over time as well, um, just to, to keep an eye on. Um, although parchment isn't as susceptible to the brittleness and discoloration that you do see in paper flaking, things like this over time, um, if it's kept in really excessively dry conditions, uh, then it also has the potential to cause shrinkage of the parchment uh, and desiccation and brittleness. Um, so I think any anything very, very dry is also it will also potentially cause some damage to parchment as well, um, just to bear in mind. Um, exposure to exposure to light, um, like with papers, it's the UV, uh, the UV rays in light that can cause uh, harmful reactions within within the structure of the, the items themselves. Um, so this can cause uh, breakage of the collagen bonds um, and can catalyze this um, this degradation within the structure. Um, and finally, again, pests. So parchment can provide an attractive, it's high protein uh, food source. So it's a, a big draw for pests. Um, creatures like silverfish or beetles, sometimes even mice um, can cause damage to parchment as they, they can eat or graze through documents. Um, you can see an example here of holes I think something's eaten through. Um, I've been working with a, a parchment document before um, where it's rolled. Um, we went to unroll it and there was actually um, holes completely through the middle. You could see little teeth marks where I think it must have been a mouse had been nibbling away at something had been chewing away. Um, so moving on to handling, handling parchment. Um, We've mentioned that it's a strong and really durable material and it can really withstand handling well. Um, but as again with paper, just some basics that are good to observe uh, for safe practice of handling parchment. Um, so again, having clean dry hands, no loose clothing that can get in the way, things like lanyards um, or scarves or rings that can scratch. Um, so parchment housed in collections, it can come Parchment comes in a wide variety of, of types and formats. And again, obviously each of these will have their own kind of specifications and considerations to have in mind. Um, books, parchment can frequently uh, come in bound form, in book form. Um, so within manuscripts, parchment, um, it can generally be in good condition. Uh, the boards themselves and the covers uh, help provide a good protection um, to, to the parchment. Um, common damages that can occur within books, again, things are going to be more damaged as a paper on the edges. They can become more weakened, fragile and stained uh, around the edges of, of books. Um, something to have in mind with, with books that may be comprised of parchment pages is that they probably highly likely to to have illuminations and pigments it's a, a characteristic of of parchment books um so these things like the the media and illuminations pigments um these can flake um and they they'll also age and degrade over time um something that we said with the parchment is that it expands and contracts over time so this expansion and contraction will also uh, kind of contribute to the movement of the media on top of the parchment um and that fluctuation can can contribute to this flaking or the damage of the the media and the parchment uh, the pigments just over time in general can become powdery or flaky or damaged um and that's also accelerated if things have been been stored in unsuitable environments. Um, so this um, these are something to be aware of. I, again, um, things like the mechanical movement, um, the way that you would turn a page of a book, um, this can cause damage to to the pages itself. Um, just to be aware of how parchment behaves uh, and the how fragile the media is on the parchment itself as to how it's being handled, the kind of stresses or movements that you're putting on the page um, and how that can affect the condition or attachment or movement of the media on the surface. Um, so 
something that is quite common to see with parchment are uh, deeds and scrolls and parchment things can frequently be quite large scale. Um, they can be composite items. And I have found I've quite often dealt with parchment things that are very unwieldy or big or quite difficult to handle. Um, they can come, things like uh, deeds and documents, they can frequently be very large, be folded or rolled, and they have this addition of a, of a seal, um, like a wax seal that can be attached with another separate piece of parchment or a ribbon. Um, and the, the seal and the ribbon themselves, uh, they can frequently be really fragile and the things that that break down to a very fragile state over time and that can also have to add to a difficulty um, with handling and consulting these big sheets of parchment um, so historically a lot of these can be stored rolled um, and the rolled format along with the possible fragility of the components like the wax seal ribbons or any media um, that also kind of complicates or contributes to considerations when handling and consulting them. Um, and things like that may need extra support or extra consideration to, to take into account how that can be safely managed or supported while you're unrolling or unfolding things. And so when handling different types of formats of parchment. Um, so we mentioned that the, the pigments and, and things on the surface, especially of rolled items, they, they may not be visible. Again, when you're dealing with parchment and you're, you're unrolling things, you're never sure what's, what's gonna be inside. Um, so things like, things like this that may be on maps or scrolls or illuminations, editions, um, these may easily become dislodged if you're unrolling or handling uh, things like parchment. Um, the parchment can tend to really want to retain its shape over time. Um, so if things have been stored rolled, it's just got this tendency to want to roll back on itself. It can be quite difficult to unroll um, and it can be wanting to kind of curl back unless it's held down. Um, so things like uh, weights and uh, having suitable things to hand when when working with parchment is is very handy. Um, so if anything feels stiff, it's good to be aware of any resistance that you might feel. Um, so going slowly and taking care not to force things open again, as we as we said with the books. Um, so if one thing that you don't want to hear if you're unrolling or unfolding parchment is um, is a kind of a crack. This is the sounds that um, parchment can make if it's kind of pushed too far in a direction it doesn't want to go. It's um, not nice and flexible if it is kind of more stiff and aged. Um, so this isn't likely to cause anything like tears in parchment, but um, it kind of effectively results in the structure being broken or snapped in a certain area. And that can cause a loss, a localized loss of strength. Um, where things like bonds have been affected and broken uh, and that can change the, the behaviour of the whole sheet over time and that can cause deformations, um, increased susceptibility to, to damage in these areas. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, like the areas of skins can also become thicker, can be thicker or thinner. Um, and that means more flexible, less flexible, that can also affect the way parchment behaves and is handled in ways of things like turning pages or unrolling scrolls as well. So just having in mind that it can, something to be aware of, things will want to flex in a certain direction or, or not in another way, they'll be stiffer, um, have certain ways in which it wants to move. And so preparation of a suitable workspace for parchment. Um, so when you're setting up a workspace for, for handling parchment, um, this ideally, as we've said, things can frequently be uh, very large scale. Um, so we'll need to make sure that there's enough space to accommodate the whole of an item. And um, that might want to, might turn out to be a lot larger than expected uh, with things like scrolls and fold outs. Um, so books, um, we mentioned before how to safely set up a book 
um, with the supports and the joins and things, that's no different uh, for, for books that have parchment or parchment covers or parchment pages. Uh, the same principle goes, um, bear in mind what type of, uh, the type of binding, the use of the book, how it may want to open or not open, um, and just the basic principles of supporting boards and uh, text block, making sure that everything's properly supported with the wedges and building up the the uh, the levels of support on each side as you're working through a book. Um, so a suitable workspace, I, again, um, same with paper, should be clean and dust free. Um, protective materials like large sheets of um, archival tissue, archival paper, Tyvek, um, they can provide a good work surface to be working on. Um, so again, as we said, if you're working with things that have been stored, that are folded or rolled, um, parchment can be very likely to curl back on itself or want to kind of retain the same shape that it's been housed in. Um, it can be useful to have weights and supports and things like this to hand, uh, making sure that they're easily accessible and ready when you need them. Um, so having everything to hand set up beforehand. Uh, snake weights and sandbags, I find, can be really useful uh, when, we're, when you're working with parchment. Um, they, they're they a nice kind of soft, not too heavy, um, kind of malleable weight that can be adjusted and kind of help fit into the, the various undulations in the parchment surface. Um, so if you are, yeah, if you are short of materials or, or anything, then again, you can wrap, um, things can be wrapped in Tyvek or archival papers to make, make some weights that can be used as well with the parchment. Um, so that's pretty much it I have for specifics on the paper and the parchment. So just to run through a couple of um, go-to resources that I use. Um, so the website on the British Library has a really useful section on handling and handling collections just in general. Um, there's a collection care page there that has uh, six videos and that's on rolled items, books, archival materials, folded items, prints, drawings and photographs and use of gloves. Um, and that's it kind of gives a visual aid um, to how ideally things could be worked or managed. I find that very useful. Um, so it's just something to point to. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the English Heritage website has a very useful uh, pest identification poster um, that is downloadable from the website as well. That's a, a useful one. Um, they've also got more resources available there for collection care. Um, and I've compiled a list, a various list of conservation resources that might be useful.